Hello, and thank you very much for the chance to talk to you today. Um, this is very much a talk appropriate for May 2021. I'm talking to you here from our spare room, and you're watching this from, well, whenever, wherever you are. Some of you are joining us on 27th of May, and others, of course, are watching this at some point in the future. And I very much wonder how these ideas will seem to you then. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself and then talking a little bit about um, my research interests. And then, of course, this is going to be about mathematics and uh, COVID-19. So um, me, my day jobs are that I'm Professor of Mathematical Biology at DAMPT at University of Cambridge. Um, DAMPT is the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics. And here you can see the Centre for Mathematical Sciences on a uh, beautiful day. And I'm also a Fellow of Queen's College. I'm the David N. Moore Fellow in Mathematics. And uh, there's uh, a nice springtime shot of Queen's with our bridge. Um, and in terms of research, um, BC stands for Before Covid. Uh, these are my research areas. If you've ever heard me give a talk um, before Covid, um, either to general audience or a seminar to uh, other academics, it would probably be one of these four areas. So firstly, I've had a long-standing interest in uh, models for virus evolution, particularly influenza, of course. And uh, my particular thing is models for co-circulating strains. So when you've got more than one variant circulating in a population and they're interacting uh, through partial cross immunity, there's some technical sides of that, how you make those models tractable within mathematics. Uh, and also, of course, interested in uh, what that means for uh, virus evolution. Um, I'm very interested in spatial patterns as well as the evolutionary patterns. Uh, in particular, I've worked on a fair bit on the influenza pandemic of 2009, in particular looking at a US data set to try and understand retrospectively how that pandemic unfolded in 2009 and also how it's different to seasonal influenza. And of course, I have a wider interest in how you build uh, spatial models and how uh, spatial transmission happens. I've been interested in also well, related to the strains, but the bio, virus bioinformatics, so using uh, genetic sequences to try and uh, pick out something interesting going on. That, uh, again, particularly influenza, you know, we've been looking at package, packaging signals to try and understand um, something about virion formation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the BBC pandemic, contagion. Um, I'm not going to talk about this much beyond this slide, but um, this was a big citizen science um, project and it was a TV show uh, which was first aired in 2018. But the citizen science side of it um, was people volunteered to use the app which collected uh, data on how they moved during the course of a day and who else they mixed with. And all of this was building towards um, getting a a stronger and better data set, more recent one, of how people mix and move in the UK. And this is all building towards um, building better models ahead of some hypothetical pandemic, hopefully to happen a long, long time after 2018. Um, but it wasn't to be. It was 2020. Uh, and the BBC pandemic data has been uh, hugely useful. I'm going to refer to one application of it in COVID-19. Um, but broadly, where I am with this is my research interests are to use mathematics to understand infectious disease dynamics. And of course, I don't need to tell this audience the point of understanding infectious disease dynamics is to be able to help mitigate and control uh, epidemics and pandemics. Well, that's all BC. COVID happens. So uh, this is a plot along the top here from the government uh, coronavirus dashboard of number of patients admitted um, by day to hospital. So this starts off, this is May, July, September. So actually just misses the start of the first wave here. And then you've got uh, November, January, right up to where we are in uh, late May. 
You've got the government's um, scientific pandemic influenza group on modelling, which is now better known as SPY-M, uh, which I'm a, a member of, and SAGE, which is the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which I've participated in and uh, contributed towards. Um, and this is really where I'm going to be coming from in this talk. I mean, since February 2020, maybe January 2020, I've been very, very much involved in the UK scientific response to this pandemic. I remain an independent university academic and I really am only one of very many scientists offering our time and whatever our relevant expertise is in scientific advice towards the UK government uh, through these bodies like SPY-M and SAGE. Let me emphasise today that I'm talking in my own capacity as an independent scientist and any views that I express here are, are my own. A lot has happened in the science and in the policy advice and um, today I also want to talk a little bit about the human side, the experience of being a mathematician working on COVID-19 during this crisis. Things for us have often been deeply challenging and some days seem just beyond what is humanly possible. And of course, working on a pandemic during the pandemic has been absolutely horrifying. Um, but among all of that, there has been bright moments. And some of them for me are as I've got to work with some really amazing people who seem to achieve the impossible on a regular basis. I've had a really privileged front row seat on um, the evolving science and the science advice. I've seen my own research fields change at an absolutely mind-blowing pace and I actually feel really lucky to have had the honour of working at a time when it's it's our opportunity to step up to the mark and do our thing. Um, this is, of course, as I speak, uh, not something which is over in the past, but is all very, very, very much live. We are still in the thick of an ongoing global pandemic. And the conundrum for me with this lecture has been knowing what to include and what to not include. I've left the options open somewhat with the title of Maths versus COVID-19. But what I've decided to do is include the elements which I hope will be most interesting to this audience. And that means rather than one long mathematical or scientific topic, what we'll do is we'll hop around between ideas, between themes, and uh, also along uh, the timeline of the pandemic. Um, but first, we'll explore the roles of modelling and what we can learn from classic results. So thinking about the role that mathematical modelling plays in fighting COVID-19, there's lots of different types of things it can do, and perhaps some of them are more obvious than others. I've got four bullet points of how I, I would think about it here. Probably the first two are more obvious than the second two. The very first one is that modelling can be used for specific predictions. In other words, forecasting. So saying based on what we know about how COVID-19 and how transmission works and what we know about where we are, what we think is going to happen in a few weeks, a few months or, or longer scale uh, time. So this is forecasting much as we'd understand it for weather forecasting, say. So these are predictions. Probably this has been the highest um, profile use of modelling and perhaps is the most obvious one. Perhaps the next most obvious one is this one, exploratory work, uh, thinking about scenarios. Now, scenarios are different to predictions um, in that they're still looking at the future, usually, um, but they're more saying, what if, um, for example, there, so what if uh, we were to close schools, what do we think will happen? What if instead we were to open schools, what do we think will happen? So then you can compare what the futures might be, at least um, according to models there. Um, again, that's probably one that you would uh, think of. And in fact, you're going to be familiar with seeing some of the roadmap modelling of predictions from different groups of what's going to happen if the different stages of roadmap modelling, ro un unlocking in the future happens. These next two bullet points uh, are maybe less obvious 
But they're the ones I'm going to talk about. They, I think they're a little bit hidden in how they fit into scientific advice, but they are important. So the third bullet point there is understanding the drivers behind observed patterns. And I'll talk you through an example below, which I hope will illustrate what I mean by that. And then finally, mathematical modelling itself is a language, a really useful language on which we can build um, our understanding and human intuition of what's going on. And I hope uh, we will go through that and I'll help build your intuition in the next two slides after this one. OK, but understanding drivers behind observed patterns first. You can see below there's a couple of different uh, pictures and this is actually extracted from a report that I presented to SPIEM uh, quite early on, on 2nd of March 2020. Um, it was using some insights from the spatial modelling uh, for the UK, which was calibrated by the BBC Pandemic Problem, Pandemic Project, and um, of course, somewhat updated and adapted for our understanding of COVID-19 at the time. Uh, the model is a full spatial model, where the UK is treated as uh, a lot of different separate patches. You probably can't see, but there's a gazillion little dots in here, particularly as you get to the more urban areas. Um, there's a model of running what's happening within each town, and then there's the transmission between towns. There's age structure uh, using the BBC mixing. Uh, there's short range and long range uh, transmission. In fact, this model was totally overkill for what I'm using it for here. Now, what's different between the simulations I'm showing here is in this one on the left, we simulate introduction of COVID-19 to UK as a single event, right? Just happens once. And because of the narrative of the BBC programme, um, Hazelmere was um, the origin of the uh, fictitious BBC pandemic. And I've used it for illustration for this slide here. I should emphasise we did actually try it starting from other places, but I like this one, so I'm showing you this one. So one initial seeding. On the right, instead, actually, there's many different uh, initial introductions. In fact, there's 20 that happen over um, a short space of time. And this is to really illustrate how things would look different if there's like one or two initial seeding events versus if there's lots. And it's really, really strikingly different. You can probably just about see this is um, time and the black curve is number of cases in UK uh, over time. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the axes because it's just shifted so uh, that zero is at the epidemic peak whenever it occurs in the simulation. The coloured curves you can see underneath are for the different uh, regions in the UK. So, for example, South East is a region, uh, Wales is a region. So splitting up into uh, 10 different subregions. And you can probably see here the coloured curves are fairly spread out. Some of them are, are a few weeks before others. Whereas on the right here, where there's lots of introductions, they're really much more in sync with each other sort of come up and peak around the same timing. In fact, uh, more specifically, you can see with this one, you've got uh, the first green curve there is London, which pops up eight weeks before the peak of the UK as a whole. UK peak is not straightforward because it's hitting different parts of the country, different times. Um, whereas here, actually, it is London ahead still, but only by a week or two. Uh, the colours in the map are... Um, which week that particular place peaks at. And what I hope you can see is there's a real spread of colours here on the left. But using the same colour scale, it's much more homogeneous here. Basically, everywhere peaks at the same time. And that leads to a much spikier um, epidemic, much bigger peak, much more in sync between places. So the message of this paper was that with a few introductions, or one or two, we expect heterogeneity in timing. There's a bit of chance in which region things arrive and how quickly they get to other regions. It's actually London that sparks first, even though Hazelmere is not in London. Um, epidemic upswing in some regions is going to be long before others. Whereas with many introductions, you expect synchrony and spikier epidemics. The trajectory is quite similar between different regions, only one or two weeks lag. Um, 
And these really aren't scenarios or predictions because you wouldn't just let this keep going. But this shows you what would happen, which tells you what you might start to see if we're in early March. If you're seeing uh, regions all coming up together, which we were in early March, that's more likely indicative that there in fact were multiple introductions to the country. We weren't seeing um, things kicking off in some regions whilst literally nothing's going on in other regions. You're starting to get this pattern emerging of things happening the same in different parts of the country. Um, so the observed patterns at the time were consistent with many introductions. Um, a spoiler retrospectively is that we now have a clearer picture by using um, the genetics, so you can use sequence data to see um, the phylogenetic tree, the family tree of the viruses, to see that actually um, this first wave in the UK was seeded actually very, very many times uh, internationally. So it wasn't just one spark, it sparked off lots of times uh, in different parts of the country. So hopefully that starts to give you an idea of what I mean by using the models to understand the drivers. This is not a prediction, it's not a scenario, but it's a way of saying, if this, it would look like this, if this, it would look like that. It looks like this one, so we can deduce there are multiple introductions. So that's the sort of uh, not so obvious use of models that we can have there. And this was one actually uh, done at the time. OK. Stepping back then to more classic results, um, these are really, really valuable for having a language to talk about these things and for building uh, a really robust insight. By robust, I mean if they're simpler models, um, they can be, while they're missing details, they are very generally applicable. They're not super special to some situation, so they will apply broadly, generally. Um, what I'm going to show you here is using the classic SIR model, which I'm going to resist giving you two slides walking you through what the equations are, um, because I would expect uh, many of you have seen this before. Um, but using that to understand what would happen if rather than having an unmitigated epidemic, we intervene to reduce transmission in some way, for example, um, by a lockdown. So what it does will depend on the strength of transmission reduction, i.e. how effective your lockdown or whatever intervention you have is, and also when the intervention is applied. Are you applying it very early or really only uh, a long time after things have kicked off? Uh, we've got two plots here. On the left, you've got maximum cases, peak prevalence, and I've normalised it to be relative to an unmitigated epidemic. So proportion of original. So one means it's as bad as it would have been if you did nothing. And zero means the peak is zero. Nothing happened. And on the right, we have the total number of cases in the whole epidemic, which we know as final size. Again, one is the same as original. Zero is nothing happened. Oh, sorry, no cases happened. Um, then what we're doing is we're changing what the intervention is the x-axis is the strength of the intervention, so transmission reduction is the same on the left and the right. It runs from zero to one. One means you've got some amazing intervention which magically stops all transmission completely, so it's like we've got a force field around every single one of us. Uh, zero is your transmission reducing, so-called transmission reducing intervention does literally nothing. Um, and everything's sort of in between, so 50% transmission reduction, etc. Um, what you can see with all the lines are, is the more transmission reduction, the smaller the total number of cases will be, and the lower the peak prevalence is, so as you move to the right the lines come down. Now the different lines, there's, there's um, some different coloured lines there, and these are when you intervene. Do you intervene when 0% uh, of people have had this, after 5%, 10%, 15 or 20 so zero is somehow you, you act actually before anything happens. And these are later. So to wait until 20% of people have already been infected is to wait probably too long. right? So this gives a range. And as you can see, the longer you wait, the higher these all are. So the higher the peak prevalence will be 
and the higher the final size. So I hope the general ordering of things that if you if you wait later it's not as good if you have a higher transmission reduction it's better um, just makes human sense but you can do a, a little bit more with this um, um, we'll get to that but just to highlight again oh no I I lied I am going to show you the SAR equations. So you can actually reduce it to a two-dimensional system. S is the number of susceptibles. I is the number of uh, infected. And mathematically, you can just write it down like this. If you scale out time, and then you've just got one parameter, which is the reproduction ratio, R. And um, I'll give you a reference for a paper walking through um, all the mathematics of this. But the absolute crux of the maths um, means you can actually write down all these results. It's, it can be done by hand. Um, is that the SIR system has a constant of motion. This function of s and i, s plus i, uh, minus log s over the reproduction ratio, um, is, is constant under SIR dynamics. Um, it, it's like energy in mechanics, you can use that it's constant to work out uh, lots of things. So you can calculate peak prevalence. Uh, you can differentiate this with respect to S and find its peak. And final size. You can use uh, initial and final conditions to find out what initial S is and final S and the difference between them as a number of people infected. Um, it's uh, very satisfying maths and fully within reach of uh, certainly a first year undergraduate and um, probably a keen A-level student with a bit of help dealing with the two-dimensional system. Okay, what can we do beyond saying harder interventions reduce things or earlier interventions are better? Well, I think there's three key insights from this immediately. First is you need early interventions and strong interventions to stop things. If you want to be down here where the proportion of the original peak is small and final size is small, you've got to have pretty effective interventions that mitigate most of transmission. And you also want to be using the 0% curve or 5% curve. You want to intervene early. And again, this should be intuitive by now. You intervene early and you intervene hard if you want to stop an epidemic. But what happens if your only available intervention is weak or the only one you're willing to put in place? Because these interventions we now understand are costly in very many human ways uh, in their own rights. Well, if you've only got an intervention which, say, brings transmission down by 20%, what does it do? Well, you can see here, you can bring the peak down by, well, more than 20%. This is below 0.8. Um, but the final size is actually not much reduced, less than 10% reduced. So weak interventions are proportionately better at bringing down the peak than the total amount. And this is very much um, the phrase that we heard a lot in spring 2020 of flatten the curve. That's what this means, a weak intervention will do this. Um, actually, an interesting thing also with the weak is the lines are very clustered at these points, right? So whether you apply um, your intervention early or late doesn't make a lot of difference, right? Unless you wait until ages after the epidemic or something. It's not very sensitive to timing because essentially what it's doing is uh, crushing the peak, not the early part of the epidemic. If, however, you've got a really strong intervention, and we now know the UK uh, lockdown was a strong intervention, it was enough uh, to turn transmission over and uh, bring the epidemic down, then it becomes more important to apply it early. So say you're talking about something, uh, the ballpark, it brings transmission down by two thirds or three quarters. Then you can see these lines are spread out very much. So if you um, intervene later, it's much less good than intervening early. That's peak prevalence and same thing on final size. So if you are going to intervene hard and, and keep your measure in place for a long period of time, um, of course, this one, uh, the SIR, simulations here, I'm assuming they stay in place forever. Um, it's important to apply early. 
you can extend this analysis to look at what happens if you do uh, interventions of a fixed duration. When is it optimal to apply them? And the other thing that we did do is look at um, the same analysis, but assuming you've got partial immunity, which was uh, relevant for thinking about the second wave in the UK, when we knew there was at least some immunity among the population. Do these insights uh, change very much? Actually, what I've shown you here, or at least the essence of it, is a paper to uh, SAGE, which I sent in February 2020, uh, which was in there. I'd already learnt by that time that less is more, so sending a one-pager with key insights uh, was worth it, but it has to be short. Um, but I can assume the readers are intelligent people who can grasp it quickly, so I just go for one or two main points. Um, there's lots of things I like about this, not least getting essentially results that are over 100 years old uh, back onto our consciousness to think about because they are relevant here. Also delighted to have simple models in capital letters in a file name of a SAGE repository paper. But in seriousness, at the bottom of this, I had this uh, sentence here. This simple approach should not replace models, including more details. But if predictions from more complex models deviate substantially from those shown here, the factors behind this difference should be identified. And in context, this was going to say at a time when uh, far more intricate models were going with very specific predictions. And um, I'm saying this, the simple SIR is useful as a benchmark to give you an idea of what's going on. If the more detailed models are telling you something slightly different, it doesn't mean they're wrong. Maybe they're more likely to be right, but you can gain an insight by understanding what factor is it in that more complex model that means that it's different. Is it because they're thinking about the UK as heterogeneous? Is there something different in the assumptions about uh, how COVID works? But what is it that makes it different? You can use these as part of a suite of approaches to help understand this. Um, this work is written up with uh, more discussion here. So the mathematics has walked through, these figures are in there, and there's actually more discussion about um, uh, how these can be used in context with more complex models. And that was uh, work with Deirdre Hollingsworth. And in fact, well, hopefully that's been published today and this DOI link will work for you. And that's in Phil Trans B. Now I'm gonna go one step even more simple. And this is to the bullet point of using this as a language to build insights still. And I realise that the audience watching this are very heterogeneous. Some of you are going to be undelighted that I've put up any form of equation. And uh, because this is joint with LMS, some of you are maths professors and you're going to know all this stuff already. I claim this simple equation here of geometric growth gives insights for everyone still, even disease modelers, right? So yielding insights, building intuition, simple is good. Let me tell you about this. So Y is the number of cases after N infection generations. There's N. We've got a multiplicative constant out the front here, A, and capital R is the most famous parameter of 2020. It's the basic reproduction ratio, R. Um, and it's simply r to the power of n, so number of secondary cases in the next generation, just multiplied by r from the previous generation, and you get this geometric growth. Um, you can work this out even on your pocket, or well, by hand, pocket calculator, generation zero. Starting condition, if I put a equals 1000, then it equal, y of naught equals 1000. After one generation, I've got 1,200. After two ge generations, I've got 1,440, and uh, so on. You can either plot them as points or just join them up by plotting this with a continuous n, so it's fine. Um, n is disease generation, which you can sort of think about as time, if you're happy to scale that to mean four or five or six days. Um, it's not strictly accurate because disease generations end up overlapping quite quickly because you can have someone infect someone infect someone quite rapidly or it can be long generations so the generations end up intertangled but if you think about this as time you still gain the intuitions uh, that you need from this 
All right. So now let's suppose, rather than cases, this represents hospitalizations. So that could be if the true cases are, say, 50 times or 100 times or 10 times as much. And this constant A sort of now scales for what proportion end up in hospital. And we've got this curve. R is 1.2. We started with 1,000 this generation. What happens mathematically as the parameters change? And then what insight does that give us on hospitalizations? So in red, I'm going to boost the coefficient at the front by 50%. So rather than 1,000, we go to 1,500. And in blue, we're going to boost uh, this ratio R by 50%. So rather than 1.2, we're going to 1.8. Now, if you're watching this um, not live, you can pause and just make sure, think through for yourself what these curves look like. Um, where are the red and the blue curves going to appear on this graph? This is something which totally doesn't work in the live lecture, but you could pause it and... Um, I'm going to assume you're either not interested in pausing it or you've now finished pausing. Um, because a bit of a trick question, it just doesn't sit on this plot. In order to fit the blue and the red curves on, I've got to rescale my y-axis. So our original black curve is now down here, Let's skirting along the bottom here. So what's going on? Well, the red curve, I'm just increasing A by 50% and that just scales up Y by 50%. So the red curve is just the black curve, but with 50% extra. So it sort of looks like the black curve the whole way through, just scaled up a little bit. The blue curve is different. It starts in the same place as the black curve. In fact, it sits under the red curve to start with. Um, but because this ratio is larger, it just grows a lot more each generation uh, until rapidly it's a long, long way from the red curve and the black curve. So this boost to R after a few generations is a much, much, much bigger deal than a boost to A. All right, so if we um, think about trying to translate back to hospitalizations, well, this, thing, this stage of thinking back is the modeling happening. To increase this coefficient at the front, that would be what you'd do if you were trying to uh, say, OK, well, this coefficient was wrong. Actually, this disease is 50% more severe than we thought, i.e. your chances of being hospitalised are 50% higher. That red change is what you'd do. However, the blue is what you'd do if you say, OK, actually, it's 50% more transmissible. I need to scale that R up by 50%. You go to this curve. And I hope that starts to build intuition. It, it's really all about um, the transmission. It's about the R. It's the ratio of cases. Severity sounds frightening. And of course, it's you know worse for someone who gets it. But the point is, fewer people get it, right? So if it's much more transmissible, you've got a lot more cases. So in short, when thinking about epidemic dynamics, it's transmission, transmission and transmission that matters. We'll come back and use these ideas again, but um, I hope that's uh, communicated that it's this uh, increase in transmission that matters the most. This part of the lecture will be more narrative on what has been happening with the modelling and how we have worked together to assist with the government scientific advice. Um, this, of course, is necessarily from my own point of view in terms of um, how I've seen events and what organisations I've been uh, part of and in touch with. Uh, you've seen this slide already. Um, but I want to think again about SPIM. SPIM existed, of course, before 2020, um, but as um, the pandemic loomed, it spun up, and in that I mean both many more meetings and many, many more researchers and subgroups, and it just expanded. Um, SPIAM pulled in wider epidemic modelling expertise, uh, really in light of what the needs of this pandemic was. SPIAM fundamentally works by combining insights from different models, but also from different modellers. Uh, we routinely work under very intense time pressures, and we often work on questions which are 
essentially not really answerable. Um, the cycle of how intensely busy we are uh, has unfolded in some sense with the epidemic, but um, somehow we never really had a quiet period. It's, it, we've been on the go um, absolutely solidly and we still are very much um, busy with things. Thinking about the um, wider math and physics community, uh, I want to talk briefly about this article, uh, which has a little bit of a story to it. Uh, one of the editors from that riff is, uh, was in touch with me and was after an opinion piece. But somehow it caught me in uh, early March at a time when I very much felt the need to share an opinion. Um, I think she asked for 200 words, but got somewhat more and not even about the topic that was asked about. And thinking about it, I don't even think it was on time either. Um, I actually wrote uh, the first draft one evening in uh, March. This was before lockdown, but when the looming pandemic was very, very much on everyone's minds. Um, a lot of colleagues, not so much the disease modellers, but colleagues in maths and related quantitative sciences were writing to me. And in some sense, this first draft was a reaction to that. Um, I have to be honest, the first draft I wrote was essentially a, a rant. And it was a rant about things that it would not help for the wider community to uh, do. Um, but this is an absolutely marvellous um, editor who saw that there was a possibility of a much more positive article in there. And we back and forth it uh, between us um, and came up with the article uh, as you'd see now, actually. But there is some of the original snark which um, survives uh, in the second paragraph there. A brief summary of it. Remember, this is for the research community, um, but not specialist epidemic modelers. There was a role for them to play in amplifying the signal, not the noise. And in uh, research worlds, that means things like, um, you know, the preprint servers were absolutely rammed with papers appearing every day. Um, but picking out what of those actually contained uh, useful information and or uh, useful insights and passing them around, that was important, or even giving short summaries of them. Communication to the public was very important. Uh, we needed those who really understood how models and um, epidemics work to dispel misinformation and comment also very much at that time on what models can and can't do. There, there wasn't much un public understanding there of that. And finally, on contributing to research, the wider field, um, uh, you know, starting from scratch wasn't going to work in the midst of a pandemic. So instead, the alternative is to join up with larger efforts and start from the state of art, find ways to join in with um, other things going on. And uh, RAMP, which I'm not going to talk about in great detail here, but rapid assistance in modelling the pandemic. Um, this was a scheme convened by the Royal Society and, and chaired by Mike Cates. And, and RAMP was uh, sort of very much part of this world, bringing the wider community uh, into COVID-19 pandemic response. I think there is much more to be said um, about how modelling and mathematics and related fields joined up what we did get right and what we did not get right in terms of how we respond to scientific emergencies. I mean, much of it was very specific to COVID-19 and in early 2020, but I, th I think there are lessons to be learnt for um, how science responds to emergencies in the future. So, Juniper. Um, Juniper stands for Joint Universities Pandemic and Epidemiological Research. I've already mentioned that SPIM um, brings together research from many different research groups. Um, some of those groups are already basically in large multi-group modelling squads in effect through their home institutions. Uh, I'm thinking of Imperial College and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, but most of the rest of us were smaller research groups. Um, but we had many, many interlinks between us. Uh, for example, we overlapped earlier in career or had the same PhD supervisor. So 
this consortium emerged really rather naturally. I would say we were basically functioning as an informal group in mid-2020, but we were formally funded by UKRI in November 2020 and we're ongoing now. Uh, here's the 16 of us who are um, principal investigators or co-investigators. Um, and there are really, really many more people who are not pictured on this, the, the postdocs and others uh, who are part of Juniper. Uh, our senior scientific programme manager, Dr Kira Dangerfield, is not pictured, but she's really key in terms of how we work together. Um, I'm going to come back and talk about the science writing uh, in the next slide. But if you want to know more about us and what we've been up to more recently, please do have a look at our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. There's talks online or, or follow our Twitter, of course. Um, we're very closely linked with the Newton Institute. And again, this is about um, interfacing with the broader academic community. So to sort of connect outwards from our somewhat SPIM based um, core and what we're doing at the moment, thinking about longer term and thinking about wider problems and the Newton and communicating through the Newton is uh, very important for that. So we've done a slightly unusual thing in Juniper, as in I haven't seen this happen in any other large scientific consortium, but we have um, in-house science communication expertise. Um, Marianne Freiberger and Rachel Thomas, pictured here, are the editors of PLUS magazine and uh, they're working very closely with us in Juniper, indeed they're part of Juniper, which means um, rather than hearing about stuff a long time afterwards the research is finished, they're, they're in, in our you know key meetings and talks and they're knowing what we're up to, which means um, they can pull this together for public communication very quickly. So PLUS magazine, and there's a snapshot of the website, is uh, for a broad audience, which includes school students, it's for public, it's for media communications. And there's also um, something which we come to term explainers. Uh, for example, every Friday you'll get the update, um, well, every Friday at the moment at least, you get the update of what SPIM consensus R value is and the growth rate for the UK. Buried in there is a comment on how to interpret a growth rate and you'll see further technical information on growth rate can be found on PLUS magazine and it links back to this uh, explainer written by Marianne and Rachel. Um, so that's there every week. Finally, some just to skim around some of the topics I've been involved with, with Juniper and Sviem, and I should emphasize I'm one researcher among many um, working on all of these things. And I'm, I can't even skim talk through all of them, but some of the key ones, perhaps uh, schools. I've been very interested in um, what's going on with schools and children in this pandemic, uh, of course, both in terms of the pandemic and also mitigating the harms from um, school closures. And related to that is higher education in universities. Working on universities, we've had a group um, centred through Juniper and the Isaac Newton Institute and uh, there I've been working week to week uh, with one of um, Gresham's um, previous professors of geometry, the marvellous Chris Budd. Um, definitely goes under the list of delightful things that's happened in this, but I've got to work with some amazing people. And the HE group are, are very much part of that. Uh, of variants, of course, in December, B117 and uh, live now, B1617.2. They are dreadful names, aren't they? And um, really, basically any of these could be another one hour lecture in its own right. Um, but don't worry, I'm only going to talk about one more now. Turning now to the last part of this lecture, we're, we're going to have a think about vaccination. This cartoon really helps me. So focus on this person here. Uh, without vaccination, this person is fully susceptible to infection, so can be infected by other people. Uh, can infect other people, so contributes transmission to others. And has a chance of a severe disease outcome, which you can think of as hospitalizations or deaths. Now, potentially, vaccination can modify all three of those things. 
Um, so vaccination can reduce the chance someone even becomes a case, whether mild or severe. If they, even if they are a case, it can reduce the chance they infect others. And if they are a case, it can reduce the chance of severe disease. So all three effects um, are actually in there. And we can think of this as susceptibility reduction, transmission reduction and disease reduction. But really, it's the combined route of disease blocking, so getting infected and chance of severe disease. So it's sort of these two multiplied together effects and transmission blocking, the chance of someone gets infected and infects others. So there's really sort of two main um, effects of vaccination blocking disease and blocking transmission. Now, we can translate this back um, immediately using the insights uh, we had from earlier. So remember this again, we've got A, R to the N. If I plot this, this is again A equals 1000, R equals 1.2, we've got the black curve again. If uh, vaccination um, has the effect of reducing the chance of disease by 50%. That would be like reducing this coefficient A by 50%. So the whole curve would just drop by a factor of two. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, vaccination reduced transmission, it was transmission blocking by 50%, this would be to reduce R by 50%. And this is a much bigger deal. So it takes it from this black curve down to this blue curve. So once again, anything you can do to disrupt infection, once you go more than a few generations of disease out, i.e. a week or two, um, the tra anything transmission blocking is far more important on the longer term. And, and really, that underpins um, what happens next. This insight will explain uh, this next bit. So I'm going to ask a harder question for which there's no simple answer. And I'm not even going to fully answer it. I'm just going to give some pointers towards ideas. Vaccination rollout. Who should we be targeting with vaccination? Of course, this is what actually happened in the UK. Through November, December, vaccination rollout starts in December. And it's very much in the context of, of a live wave uh, and turning over that wave. The difficult question I'm going to ask, even though it's already happened, looking back or thinking about a future pandemic or another country? How do we decide what vaccine priority order should be? And um, here's some points here. What should the priority order be? Should it be the most vulnerable? The people who have the highest chance of severe disease? Should it be perhaps those who are most put at risk by the work that they do? For example, healthcare workers. Should it be those who are most needed at work, which of course includes healthcare workers, but you can think through other roles where if they were out of action, it would be um, societally very disruptive? Or should we be targeting vaccine to get those who are most connected with other people? And you might think you know what I'm gonna say on this, having thought about the previous talk and I say transmission is, is everything. But actually this is really subtle. Um, it really depends what you're trying to achieve here. Um, and it's, there are hard human decisions to be made. There's complex ethical issues here for society. Mathematical modelling can't answer those ethical issues directly. There's a human decision to be made. But where we fit is mathematical modelling can show what the population level consequences of these different options uh, would be. And I should emphasise here, I'm not criticising at all what the UK did. I'm sure it was right. Um, but I think it's also fine to go back and think about what else we could do if we knew we had a different type of vaccine or a different situation in future. So here's a simple approach here. So it really comes down to population heterogeneity as to who you're going to choose to vaccinate. And you can think of the whole spectrum of society being complex, or you can just take it down to two simple groups. So I'm going to split the population into two. There's going to be the vulnerable. You might think about this as the older part of the population who have a higher probability of severe disease. And the mixers who do a lot more interacting 
with each other and other people and the vulnerable. They're just much more mixy, but they're not so vulnerable to disease. And uh, split the population 50-50 just uh, for initial exploration. And as uh, this is a, a joint LMS Gresham lecture, I'm going to lapse a little bit into maths, but I'll, I'll tell you what this means uh, in a bit. But just on these slides here, we've got a mixing matrix um, here. So the mixes mix M times more with anyone. What I mean by that is the columns are those who are doing the infecting vulnerable mixes and the rows are who they infect. So the vulnerable mixes. If I normalize it, so the vulnerable to vulnerable is rate one, then vulnerable to mixes is rate M because the mixes mix M times as much. Mixes to vulnerable is M and mixes to mixes is M squared. And that's what I mean about this with anyone. There's no preference for mixes to mix more with mix. That sounds terrible as a sentence. There's no preference of who's mixing with who. It's just how mixy you are full stop. And it gives you this matrix structure. I hope you can make sense of that. Um, there's more of this in this preprint here, which is um, actually about vaccine escape as well as about vaccine strategies. Uh, now, vaccination. So we take this situation and we can go ahead and do some vaccination. So we vaccinate proportion V1 of the vulnerable and some proportion V2 of the mixes. Now, effectively, we've got four populations rather than just two, the unvaccinated vulnerable mixes and the vaccinated vulnerable mixes. And this now gives us a four by four mixing matrix, which uh, looks a bit yuck to start with, but actually there's loads of structure there. Each of the two by two blocks uh, is essentially started by the one M, M, M squared matrices from before of the mixing. The rows have these multipliers of what proportion uh, of the population is in these groups now. So one minus V1, one minus, sorry, one minus V1, one minus V2, V1, V2. And these thetas are these modifiers because of vaccination. So these uh, vaccinated vulnerable and mixers are less infectious. These vaccinated vulnerable and mixers are less susceptible. And it gives you this structure. But the, the nice thing mathematically is, even though this is a mess, you could build this out of, um, if you multiply all the rows by this and all the columns by this, you get this matrix. So it's got the structure of being an outer product. Um, the nice thing there um, is that if a matrix can be written as an outer product, then, um, well, if we're interested in its eigenvalues, uh, all bar one are zero, and the one that's non-zero is actually just um, well, it's, the, it's the trace, which is the dot product of these two vectors here. This is really good because if you've got a next generation matrix, um, the effective R that we get from it is proportional to the dominant eigenvalue, either the one with the largest modulus, which is uh, always real and positive because everything's real and positive inside the matrix. So we can write down a nice expression for how R scales as we change from no vaccination, when it's R0, um, increasing vaccination. And it's, it's, it's literally this, which you can probably see greatly pleases me that I can just write down a pen and paper result. It, it's not just for mathematical entertainment. The, the strength of this is it is an analytic result. You don't need to check my code. Um, the, the, the result is there. It's not tied up in computation. Uh, you can take that and you've got an R value and you can go ahead and say, OK, so I'm going to run an epidemic forward for a few generations, which we can also do analytically uh, and say how much disease there's going to be if I vaccinate a certain number of vulnerable and a certain number of um, the mixes. So on the horizontal axis here, I've got what proportion of the vulnerable I'm vaccinating and on the vertical what proportion of the mixes. So bottom left is no one is vaccinated. Top right is everyone is. Uh, out here on the horizontal are uh, vaccinated the vulnerable but not the mixers and vice versa up here. Uh, the colours I'm plotting are how much disease there is relative to an unmitigated situation. So down here in this uh, corner here would be if um, no one's vaccinated, it's one. 
it's normalised to that. And as you vaccinate people, it drops off. So it's highest here and it drops down. It actually drops down to effectively zero pretty quick because I'm assuming there are other interventions uh, in place as well. So um, some partial lockdown, for example. Now, what can you tell from this? Well, it's really about the direction of these lines. Suppose I've got enough vaccine to vaccinate 40% of the vulnerable or 40% 40, 40 of the mixers. Which one's better? First instinct might be it's the vulnerable because you're trying to stop disease and they're the ones who are going to get it badly if they get it. But actually that's not true. You, you get down to lower numbers, you drop down the contours faster if you go up vertically here to vaccinate the mixers. And the intuition behind this is exactly as I've shown before with those um, geometric growth. It's getting the transmission down just reduces the cases and the vulnerable. So even though the vulnerable may not be directly protected, the indirect effects accumulate much faster of getting transmission down. So if vaccination has some transmission blocking effects, then it can be better to use the vaccination to reduce transmission rather than directly protecting the vulnerable. Um, I'm going to caveat this quite carefully here. There's many, many caveats, and um, please do have a look at our paper on this. There's, in fact, a page and a half just called caveats. This is really dependent on timescales. Actually, you, you saw in those exponentials a few slides ago, actually, they cross over after one or two generations. But if you're thinking about a very short-term intervention, like you've got an explosive situation and you just want to deal with it, of what's going to be, happen for the next few weeks, um, then on the very short term, it's um, more intuitive to vaccinate the vulnerable, and, and that holds true. Um, all of this work was limited by thinking about two populations only. And really, reality is a real spectrum of uh, mixes and vulnerable. You can think about it in terms of ages, so maybe the older are more vulnerable for um, severe outcomes of disease. Certain age groups, younger adults are, are more mixy. You know, you've also got different vulnerabilities within different age groups. Uh, you've, you've got some young adults who've been shielding through this pandemic um, and you've got different mixing. And then, uh, as mentioned before, you've got complex um, interplays like healthcare workers. They're both sort of part of vulnerable and mixing in that they could infect vulnerable and they're part of the nodes of mixing. So really... Um, caution here this is only a two population model but it does at least give uh, an insight which makes some human sense but if you go ahead with intuition and combine these you can see that an optimal strategy if you're dealing with the vaccine rollout uh, just to bring an outbreak down optimal strategy under realistic conditions could be to vaccinate the extremely vulnerable first and then pivot to tackle the most mixing if you've not been able to get cases down by other means. It will really depend on the precise population distribution. And I should caveat that this is less important if you found some way of getting cases down by other interventions. But uh, I, this is where the talk comes to a stop quite abruptly. There's ongoing work here. Um, this, you know, as mentioned right at the start, this is the talk uh, which is happening sort of whilst we're still live working on this pandemic. In, indeed, tomorrow morning, I'll be back in meetings with the Junipers to find out the latest uh, work on new variant. Um, so that's where I'm going to end it. Please um, have a look at some of the papers I've linked and um, uh, some of the sources of finding out more of what we're up to at the moment. Um, I know this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through different topics. Um, but I hope very much this has given you some insights into how modelling has fitted into uh, scientific response to COVID-19 and how maths versus COVID-19 is working. And I hope this has been interesting for you. Thank you.